Good morning, y'all. You ever, uh, you ever have like uh, the last little bit of shampoo at the bottom of the bottle and like you're trying to like scrape your pinky around and like try to get the last little bit out? That ever happened to you? That's kind of what we're doing with the Beatitudes, right? We're trying to get everything out of it before we move on and the Sermon on the Mount. And so I'm going to read all of them again uh, this morning. So if you have your Bible with you, uh, please turn to Matthew chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 3 through 12. Now hear the words of the one true and living God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. So remember the Beatitudes, they're not describing different kinds of people. They're describing one kind of person, the Christian. This is what Christian character is built on, humility and an awareness of the forgiveness they've received from God and how they live as a result of that. Jesus isn't telling us then what we should be as much as he's describing what the power of the kingdom of God makes us. This isn't a list of people Jesus intends to bless. It's a list of qualities and characteristics the Christian possesses, and the Christian's possession of them is a blessing to them and to the world. I've been looking forward to to this sermon for a few weeks now. I've been excited about this because I want to show you something here that's that's just kind of neat, something that kind of just it kind of slips under the radar. You wouldn't know it was there, but I'm going to show it to you. Uh, there's a literary device in Hebrew uh, that we call a chiasm, all right, in Hebrew literature, and it's used to tie ideas together and to draw emphasis to things in Hebrew literature, okay? In Matthew, as you may know, Matthew's Gospel is a very Hebrew book. Its primary intended audience was first century Jews, and it draws on familiar themes and and literary structures and devices used in the Old Testament to show Jews that Jesus really is the promised Messiah that their prophets told them about and that the Old Testament pointed to. And lo and behold, Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes, which are structured in this chiastic format. I've actually formatted the text in your bulletin for you so you can see that more clearly. I've indented the lines to point out the structure itself and made some indications of the words used in each line to highlight how they complement each other so you can see some of the parallels, okay? So let's look at it again one more time, all right? Starting at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus opens and closes the Beatitudes with the kingdom of heaven. Verses 3 and 10. Because everything in the middle is what the kingdom of God is like. And what is in the bull's eye middle? Right in the very center of the rest? Righteousness and mercy. Verses 6 and 7. Whose is the kingdom of heaven? Look back. 3 and 10. The poor in spirit who are persecuted for righteousness sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Who shall be comforted and be called sons of God? Those who mourn evil in the world and make peace, verses 4 and 9. 
Who shall inherit the earth and who shall see God? The meek who are pure in heart, verses 5 and 8. This is what the kingdom of God looks like because this is what his people look like. They look like Jesus. And what's at the center of all this? Righteousness and mercy. So here's the main idea of the sermon this morning. Righteousness and mercy are the gift of God to you, and you are the gift of God to the world. Don't believe me? Look, look at the very next thing Jesus is about to talk about in the Sermon on the Mount. He opens with the Beatitudes and what you immediately follow them up with. All right, look in your Bible if you have it with you. Look, look at where Jesus takes us immediately following the Beatitudes in verse 13. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. That's a later sermon, but I want you all to see that this morning. Righteousness and mercy are the gift of God to you, and you are the gift of God to the world. That's not an overstatement. You were saved for a reason. And the reason is to reveal the kingdom of God coming into the world. How do we do that? Righteousness and mercy, purity, peacemaking. What's it look like? Persecution. Blessed are you, verse 11, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So we have some present and future aspects of the kingdom of God. This is what it's like, right? And this is how it's going to go down. That's what we believe. And what we believe should always shape our conduct, right? What happens at this turning point of possessing and pursuing righteousness is that it begins to shape how we behave. We have been transformed, and there's a cause and effect here. As we become more like Christ, here's what we can expect to happen as a result. We have received grace and righteousness. And so what's the effect then? What's the effect of having received grace? Mercy. Mercy is grace in action. Purity. Purity is a result of having received grace. And purity is spiritual potency. Peace. Striving to make peace in the world. Not keep peace with the world. We make peace according to God's standard. We're we're, we're not keeping peace according to the world's standard. So it's another effect of having received grace and possessing the mind and attitude of Christ. And persecution is the expected outcome of living that way. So there you are. There's your, there's your four main points for the sermon this morning. All right. Mercy is grace in action. Purity is spiritual potency. Peace is made, not kept. And persecution is the expected outcome of living a pure life and offering God's mercy and peace to people who hate him. And don't be shy about raising your hand if you need me to read those again, if you're a note taker, okay? My wife's a note taker and she tells me all the time I go too fast. Okay? Seeing none. First point. Mercy is grace and action. Mercy is given where grace has been received. Remember, this isn't saying, I'll show you mercy if you show mercy. It's saying, you you know you have been shown mercy, so show mercy. If we're slow to show mercy, it could be that we have not received mercy. Those who have received mercy know they didn't deserve it. And so it's hard for them to withhold mercy from someone just because they don't deserve it. What's the difference between grace and mercy? You guys ever ask yourself that question? I think it's a good delineation. All right. Here's a quote I thought was helpful that I think gets at it. All right. Grace is especially associated with men in their sins. Mercy is especially associated with men in their misery. 
Mercy is more of a desire to relieve suffering. The Good Samaritan, I think, is the greatest example of that. You, you remember Jesus talking about the Great Samaritan, right? He's, he's going down the road and sees a guy left for dead on the side of the road, and, and everybody just keeps passing him by. You know, priests, religious leaders, people who knew better and could have helped him but didn't. But it's the, the Samaritan guy. He has pity on him, right? He goes and he dresses his wounds. He, he picks him up. He gives him a ride. He puts him up in a hotel, tells the innkeeper, here's some money. Take care of this guy until I come back. And if you spend more than I've given you, don't worry. I'll cover it when I get back. And then Jesus says, which of these men loved his neighbor? And the lawyer he's talking to says, the one who showed him mercy. Of course. Mercy is grace in action. Having been given grace, where our sin was met with unmerited favor, and having received mercy where God met us in our misery, we possess a gift that can be given to the world. These beatitudes hinge on righteousness and mercy. Righteousness and mercy are the gift of God to you, and you are the gift of God to the world. Point number two. Purity is spiritual potency. Inner moral holiness is different than external piety. It's not just looking the part. You remember who gave the appearance of being holy in Jesus' day? The Pharisees, right? They were clean on the outside but filthy on the inside. Jesus called them whitewashed tombs. Pretty on the outside, dead on the inside. Purity isn't putting on a show of being holier than thou. Expecting people to, to read something good into your character just by what you turn your nose up at. Purity, true purity is spiritual potency. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5 says, Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. He will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. And as all of us here know, I hope, the only way to have a pure heart is to recognize you have an impure heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it, right? Jeremiah 17, 9. We don't fix it by putting a, a fresh coat of paint on it or, or, or spit shining it. The heart of stone bound by sin has to be broken and replaced with a heart of flesh that beats for God and is sensitive to the Spirit. This goes back to what we talked about in the very beginning, about being poor in spirit, mourning over sin, craving righteousness. And when we talk about being pure in heart, the heart is, is, is the mind, the, the heart, the soul, the will. It's the total person. It's all of it. Not just the intellect, not just the emotions. So that's what's impure by nature. And what needs to be made pure supernaturally by the Holy Spirit. The whole person. You know, people say wicked men are often a product of their environments. We blame environments. Bad neighborhoods, bad schools, bad families. I, I'm not saying those don't play a role. What I am saying is that when man fell, he was in paradise. It was perfect. That was his environment. A man has everything he needs to be as evil as he can be, regardless of where he comes from or what environment he's in. We are totally depraved, fallen in all of our faculties, in our reasoning, in our motives. The problem is not out there, it's in here. There are external factors that make significant contributions uh, to, to how we develop and, and influence us to be sure, but the raw ingredients are already there. We have impure hearts. So why don't we start there? 
because we don't want to be told we're the problem. We want to be victims of circumstances or environments or experiences so that we can blame it on someone else. We want to imagine ourselves as basically good rather than come to grips with what the Bible says, that our hearts are above all things deceitful and desperately wicked. I said before, righteousness and mercy are God's gift to you, and and you are His gift to the world. So what's that got to do with purity being spiritual potency? Where where are we going with this? Here it is. The impure heart, y'all, is a divided heart. It's scattered into every direction because no matter which direction it looks, it sees something it loves. The pure heart has one love, one aim, one goal. The impure heart, the divided heart, is exhausted in its pursuit of everything that it can't have. But the pure heart rests assured it has everything because its deepest desires have already been met in Christ Jesus. Impurity likes to hide from God and from men. It doesn't want to be found out. It's not secure. It is insecure. And it makes men weak, and purity does. Purity is potent. The pure in heart are single-minded. They only ever need to wear one face. They don't have to change costumes as they move from one one room to another or figure out who they're supposed to be in, in this particular set of company. They know who they are. They have a single goal of pleasing the Father rather than pleasing men. Spiritual potency, y'all. Purity is spiritual potency. Looking at peace now. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So the point here is peace is to be made, not kept. Because you can't keep what you don't have. Peace isn't something you have to give or to keep. It's something God gives and makes. He makes peace. You can't keep what you don't have. Anyone in this room who is married with more than one child knows exactly what I'm talking about, okay? And that doesn't mean if if, if you're not married or you only have one child that you can't understand this. I'm simply saying that the more sinners you have living under the same roof, the more evident this principle becomes, As soon as the house wakes up, there are infinite numbers of possibilities and opportunities in the day for selfish wills to collide. Sinners just smash into each other before you've had your first cup of coffee. And chaos is the default mode of a household. That's what you get when you don't do anything. It's It's just natural. It just happens. It's not supposed to be that way. It's not how creation began. God is not a God of disorder, but of order. But the fall brought disorder. And God had to come order it, didn't he? Where there was enmity with God, God had to make man to be at peace with God. And because he has, and because we're to be like him and think his own thoughts after him, we are to make peace. You can't keep what you don't have. We don't keep the peace. We make peace. And in the home, that looks like being intentional. Husbands, perhaps it looks like going out of your way to serve your wife. You know, hopefully all of us by now know how to put the toilet seat down, right? But how about the honey-do list? Huh? How about the honey-do list? Is that ever a source of tension between you and your wife? Maybe some things that, you you, you know, you haven't gotten around to because they're not that important to you, but they're important to her. Yeah. Come on, man. You can do that. You can make peace there. That's not hard. Right? Wives, you can make peace by making that list a little shorter. I mean, not everything's an emergency, right? Not everything's a priority. You can make peace by managing your expectations and disciplining your disappointments. I know he lets you down. Listen, ladies, I know he's not perfect. He's a work in progress. 
But you know what? You, you are the most effective tool, the most effective refining tool in the hand of the Redeemer to make him into what he's supposed to be. Now, you are the tool, not the hand, okay? So don't work against him. Work with him. Make peace. Children, you're not off the hook. You can make peace simply by obeying your parents the first time they ask. Did you know that God promises that if you honor and obey your parents, things will be easier for you? He promises that. Things will go well for you if you do that. Do you know that? And y'all, I'm, I'm talking to you because God's word this morning, this is for you. It's not just for grown-ups, right? You're a part of this church and you're a part of this family and we all want to see you do well. Honor your father and mother. It will go well for you. One of the blessings that you'll receive is you'll grow up in a peaceful home. That's a blessing. Honor your parents. And making peace outside of the home in other contexts, work, school, church, often look like being a part of the solution and not part of the problem. Identifying a problem is easy. Anybody can identify a problem, right? Not everybody can come up with solutions and provide solutions. And sometimes the solution is simply not stirring the pot, right? Nobody ever said you had to show up to every fight you were invited to. A harsh word stirs up anger, but a gentle answer turns away wrath, Proverbs 15 says. One way to make peace, then, is to just keep your mouth shut. That's not passive. That's intentional. That's hard to do. James says so, doesn't he? Control of the tongue is hard, but it must be done. The tongue is dangerous. It sows discord. It lights fires that can burn the place down, whatever the place may be, churches, organizations, even nations. The peacemaker is not immune to feeling like there's, like saying things that, that, that he shouldn't say. He just knows better and so he doesn't. For the sake of peace and as an expression of his meekness, he keeps his mouth shut. Other times making peace is recognizing you're not the solution that you are not the solution, someone else is. And so you encourage them to get involved and, and help them to exercise their particular gifting that will contribute to the good of the whole. And again, that's, that, that's at work, that's at school, uh, church. That works. That works. I'll tell you one thing I think is good for us to remember as a growing family of God here at King's Church. Guessing at people's motives is a good way to not make peace. That's a good way to not make peace. We're about to be formally established as a church this very afternoon, y'all. And I want to remind us, we're not the, at the end of something. We're at the beginning. We're at the beginning. So let's remember this. We have peace with God, and that should make us willing to make peace with others, especially one another in the church. Here's the thing, though. When you see peace needs to be made, don't avoid it. Don't avoid it. You go make it. Go make peace with one another when you recognize peace needs to be made. Peace is not merely an absence of conflict. It's a worthy end that may require conflict to achieve. Did Jesus enter the conflict to make peace with you? It was worth it. You were worth it. I know, I know I've said from this pulpit, I don't know how many times, but I'll keep saying it until you believe it. And then I'll keep reminding you so that you never forget. But value is how much someone is willing to pay for something. How much was Jesus willing to pay for you? It was worth it. 
you're worth it. Your brothers and sisters in these pews next to you are worth it. Make peace. It's intentional is the point. You make peace. You don't keep it. Be proactive. On a larger outside these four walls in our communities and on a societal scale, that means you don't cower and bury your head in the sand in order to keep the peace. Making peace is not saving your own skin and not rocking the boat. God's brand of peace looks very different from the world's. And in many cases, making peace according to God's standard looks like disturbing the peace to man. You know what? He disturbed my peace. Did he disturb yours? Unless you were saved very, very young, you probably were at peace with your sin or thought you were. And then he came and disturbed you, didn't he? We don't keep the world's brand of peace for the sake of not rocking the boat. We make peace according to God's standard, and sometimes, most times, that rocks the boat. It is counter-cultural. And so last point, persecution is the expected outcome of living a pure life and offering God's mercy and peace to a people who hate him. Now, this will be the shortest point this morning, okay? We're just scratching the surface here. There needs to be a whole other sermon on persecution, and there will be. You can look forward to that next week in verse 12. But a few brief comments here on this point. An inevitable consequence of displaying Christian behavior is persecution. We've said already uh, in previous sermons that the preacher of the Sermon on the Mount is the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus, and his message is simple. You are mine, be like me, right? And if you're going to be like him, people will hate you because they hated him. You know, I just want to put this out there. Whatever it is the world believes about Jesus is wrong. This tells you everything you need to know about Jesus, okay? Jesus was not some long-haired, hippie, surfer Jesus who just, that everybody loved. If that were true, y'all, they wouldn't have nailed him to a cross. He says, if the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own, but because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. The people you can think of in the Bible who were persecuted the most were the most righteous. The righteous were the ones that were persecuted. Cain persecuted his brother Abel, right? Abel made him look bad because he loved and obeyed God more than Cain. Saul persecuted David because he was just too good. Daniel was righteous, and so they tried to feed him to lions. Too righteous, in fact, so righteous that the lions wouldn't eat him. God spared him so that that righteousness in Daniel could go and do its work among others. So God's glory could be on display in Daniel and have its intended effect on those around him. And that's what God does in you, Christian. But these people who are humble, who mourn for their sin, who are gracious and pursue righteousness and mercy, who are pure in heart and seek peace between God and man and man and one another. I mean, these are the kind of men and women the world needs, isn't it? And yet, they are met with persecution. Persecution is the expected outcome of living a pure life and offering God's mercy and peace to people who hate him. There's a lot more to say about persecution, and we will next week, okay? But wrapping up this morning, righteousness and mercy, this hinge of the Beatitudes or hub from which all the other spokes are attached, are the gift of God to you, and you are the gift of God to the world. It's not an overstatement. You are saved for a reason. 
And the reason is to reveal the kingdom of God coming into the world. What has been given to you is to be given by you. You have been given righteousness and living that out in the world is is, is not a detriment to the world. However unwelcome it may seem, it is an improvement. It is a seasoning. I don't want to give anything away from the salt and light thing. It's coming. But persecution is the response you get when you offer the world a gift it doesn't want. They don't want God. They don't want him in their knowledge. They don't want him in their laws. They don't want his word to be a governing principle in their lives. They want to be a law unto themselves. They don't want it. But they'll get him anyway. They'll get them anyway. They'll either accept the gift or they'll live with what they've got already, which is his judgment. Will we see them as what they are? Miserable and in need of mercy. Will we stop along the road and dress their wounds? Or ignore them and just pass along minding our own business in order to Keep the peace. To him who has given much, much is expected. Didn't Jesus say that? Have we received anything less than everything in Christ Jesus? You've received righteousness and mercy from your maker. He gave himself to give it to you. And because he has given you that gift, like it or not, you are his gift to the world. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we stand in awe of your splendor. You are El Shaddai, God Almighty. Your power and glory and majesty are evident in all of your creation. But God, we thank you especially for your word that as big as you are and as small as we are, you allow yourself to be known by us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for applying to us the redemption accomplished for us by you, Lord Jesus. Stir up in us religious affections, God, that we may be used by you to accomplish your ends in the world, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that you, Jesus, are Lord. You are our Savior and our King, and we love you. God, I pray you return us all safely here tonight to enjoy the celebration of what you've done among us in recent years in establishing this church and to help us enjoy the fellowship of our guests who want to witness the ceremony of our establishment and the election of the men you have called to serve among us. Until then, Father, we leave this morning offering these prayers in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen.